Stu Armstrong with interviews that pack a punch. Hello and welcome to Radio Northumberland. My name's Stu Armstrong and this is Stu Armstrong Interviews, where on each show I interview someone from the world of combat sports. My background, as you may know, is that of the author of the Diaries of a Dorman series of books and the patron of the charity Choose Lives Not Knives. This week's brave guest, who's agreed to let me grill them for your listening pleasure, is Cliff Sainsbury, the brains behind Peep Magazine. Obviously, welcome to the show. For the old listeners who don't know what Peep Magazine is, can you just give a, a bit of a rundown of what it actually is and how it fits with combat sports? Peep is kind of a photojournalist magazine, sort of. Well, I started about three, four years ago now, but it, it started off as a, like a photojournalistic ju- kind of thing, not to do with boxing or anything. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, well, a good friend of mine called Scott Illingworth, we kind of invented Peep. For long story short, my huge interest with boxing, started getting in, into the boxing scene and then got invited to the shows, but I'm sure we'll talk, talk about that later. Mm-hmm. Um and then it just started covering the fights at ringside, backstage, getting the backstage passes, chatting all the guys, and then it's kind of blew up. Who's uh, who's involved with Pete Magazine at the moment? Well, it was orig- originally just me and Scott, but he kind of backed out because it was just had um he he wanted to keep it the old style of Pete. I wanted to go in, into the boxing. Yeah. So how it's how it's formed is there was just me kind of doing it photography and then by chance i bumped into a guy called phil Lindsay, who you'll know yourself Do but, um he's a journalist for box rec mm-hmm. um anyone who's anyone in uh, like the boxing scene uh i'll know he kind of does the articles for that and keeps up to date with all the boxers from uh, like the region and whatnot yeah bumped into him by chance of a uh, gossip mm-hmm. i was kind of there doing photographs for the crowd but me and Mark started chatting and kind of didn't really kick it off then, but um, seeing him maybe a few months down the line yeah. at a um, public workout over the Mar- the Mara Centre, mm-hmm. um, again with Mark, I think Steve Race was there as well. Uh, it was a, kind of one of the first times to start chatting with Steve, uh, like really sound guy, and then started chatting to Phil again, pro- probably, and he's, he was a bit curious about what Peep was, and then, like I say, it was just breaking in, into the boxing then. And then he had big plans with them um, because I think he still works with North East Fight Scene. So, to your question, Phil Lindsay, <laughs> yeah. I'll I, just kind of give you the whole breakdown. I heard you've got a really uh, good-looking fella who's just joined the team who's uh, concentrating on BKB and unlicensed. Oh, yes. I think I can't remember his name. Oh, it's Stu Armstrong. Ah, that's the fella, that's the fella. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just try and do it in order. Uh, so it was Phil, and then Mark Clo- Clo- Clozell came kind of on board. Yourself, who I got in touch with, was about a month, was only about a month, two two months ago. About two months ago, something like that. I had seen that you had sub- subscribed to a YouTube channel. I knew originally that you had um, wrote a co- couple of books there. The mm-hmm. Diaries of, of a Dorman, which I'm reading now, by the way. And they're, ex- uh, they're excellent, did you say, and available on Amazon? Yes, I just said that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I knew you had a, a kind of an en- a huge interest in the BKB scene. Yeah. So I thought, well, this is good because I've kind of got Phil on board. I've got Mark on board, who's got like loads of contacts. Uh, and if I can get Stu on board, I thought... That's kind of breaking into the BKB there. And that's when I gave you that email, just to see if you were interested. I've got to say, I mean, I'm, I'm absolutely over the moon to be part of the team. I mean, I was mm. petrified at first. Well, like like I am now. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. That's yeah. it. I mean, I've never met you before. And we met at the uh, Reps Gym and Walls End the day before the Big B Bad Show in Newcastle. There was a British title fight, Craig Amor and Michael Ferry. And then you were ringside to be bad show, and since then we're going to all the be bad events now to do some work. Walls will be invited by Rage and Bull to go to their BKB events. And then just this morning I was talking to James Quinn uh, from the film Knuckle, who runs Knuckle Promotions, and uh, kindly invited to go and cover James's as well. So yeah, it's all gone really quickly. That's it. So what sports are, are covered in Peep? Obviously we've said boxing, 
it's professional yeah. boxing BKB. It's kind of first love is professional boxing. We're going to break into the amateur scene uh, also in the northeast. Yep. Uh, which we haven't really scoped on yet, but we've all we've already done a lot a lot of interviews with uh, some of the uh, the amateur lads over um, with Mark Mark Closel, mm-hmm. um, and then white collar boxing, which I'm a huge fan of. Yeah. Because that's that, that's kind of do. Um, Apart from those ones, you know. Yeah. But like I say, I'm all, I'm quite open to suggestions about other uh, combat sports, you know. But we'll just have to see see what happens, really. Professional body dancing or something like that. Um, <laughs> I'll get back on that one. No bother. <laughs> so, in addition to the obviously the very popular Peep Magazine YouTube channel, there's also a digital magazine as well. Is there any possibility of that going into print at any time soon? Yes, the plan was the issue that I've just put out that was supposed to go to print 38 pages full colour I had I had everything down I had I had all the uh, the images print ready I had a distri- distribution co- company just uh, like waiting to, to put it out but as a, as we've said a few if you that I just I, at the end of it I just didn't have time to do it that's it. But it's still, it's still like, it's still at the forefront of every mind. Um, that it's, it just, the whole part of people in that printed magazine has to, has to get out. Yeah. If um, I mean, obviously, if this, this is going to go ahead at some point, if there's any companies out there that would be interested in maybe sponsoring Peep Magazine or taking out advertising space, would that be possible? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, um, we'll always, uh, like, we'll always be looking for advert space. Um. Whether it's online with the videos, online displays, or video advertisements, uh, and then the magazine adverts. But, but, but we're definitely looking for a, like a large company to come on board, maybe like a serious in, investor um, yeah. to take peep to the next level. But uh, I think we're doing a good job at the moment, but I think there's always space for, uh, there's literal space for advertising. Yeah. With, a, with the right type of com- company, of course, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's it. So if somebody out there was interested, uh, how could they go about it? Well, you can contact me direct uh, at cliff at Um Or you can go to Twitter, you can get in touch with us loads of different ways. So you can just go straight to the website, um, peepmagazine.co.uk. Uh, Twitter, at Peep Magazine. Just, I'm um, really easy to find, you know. Yeah. Uh, again, and what I normally say in the expeditions like this, I um, I put some links to my website, which is stuarmstrong.com, but they're already there. So I mean, as you say, beatmagazine.co.uk, or there's links through my uh, website as well. Uh, what would you like to ultimately achieve with Pete Magazine? Do you think? Um. Well, the the ultimate goal was is to build a rep in in the northeast for quality work, build a trust with the good work with. Boxers, pro- promoters, tra- trainers. The first point of contact for combat sports within the northeast, um, and then branching out to Manchester, Leeds, eventually hit London soon. But we've got we've got big uh, competitors down there. Um, to- total world domination. Total world dom. <laughs> yeah, I all already supply a lot of the photographs to to various promoters. Yeah, I know uh, there was a. Uh... And whatnot. A photograph that you took, and being a photographer, you probably didn't think much of it at the time. The last big bad show of Michael Ferry when he won the heavyweight BKP title. Oh it, yeah, no, it's just, that's it's when all simple. the way that's when all the way around the world it's been in American newspapers, it's been in Gracchus magazine, it's even been made into t-shirts at the moment. I know it's amazing that uh, I didn't think much of it at the time. You're right, because um, it was obviously my first BKB show. Yeah, and I was terrified, but um, <laughs> I managed to jump up on the side of the ring like I usually do, and um, I just got the shot of the real deal. It was a perfect, perfect shot. He just got yeah. his belt, and the smile on his face, I think, just summed it all up. Yeah, yeah, he's a nice guy as well. Quite quiet, but uh, what a top guy! Ah, uh, um, yeah, he's a nice fella. He gave all the time in the world, you know, for them in, in, interviews and. Well, never forget it was doing those interviews. I mean, I was terrified. Mm. And we had, uh, imagine I just met Cliff for the first time, and then Cliff's got the camera on us. I met Michael Furry for the first time. 
We are standing sort of face to face, ready to start, and just as the camera started, he turned around and went, Stu, and blew as a kiss. Well, we just started to laugh, and we couldn't stop. And every time the camera started to, I think that's helped me out a little bit as well. Mm. Yeah, yeah, he's, um, like, uh, you know, he didn't have much to say at first, but you could tell he was starting to open up a bit. I did. But it, it, it's always tough when that camera's on you. Fool, like, you're telling um, me. I'm fine when I'm behind it, you know, but so if someone po- points a camera on me and or someone wants to, in- to interview us, I'll, like, I always start getting a bit nervous. Yeah. Ah, uh, you're doing fine. Oh, it feels me. <laughs> so, obviously, as we've talked about, um, Pete Magazine started out covering pro boxing, said we're encompassing BKB, white colour boxing, and K1, looking through Dave Whale uh, with the dual fight scene. Was it a conscious decision to move into these areas? Yes, um, because I, uh, I love the pro scene so much with the boxing and whatnot. It was just kind of a natural progression, I would say. Um, yeah. And it's not like it's not at all. I'm get it's not like I'm getting bored with the boxing scene or anything like that because I absolutely love doing it. But it's just a, a, kind of a natural thing to do. And, uh, and when people are getting in touch with us, can you come down and do my show or? I mean, uh, like you know yourself, Stu, uh, that we're getting inquiries every day now. It's fantastic. Uh, from am- uh, amateur clubs to K1 uh, events uh, to BKB now, and then K1 down in Wembley, like I'm going to go to next month. Yep. So it's, yeah, it's, um, I definitely did want to move into those areas, and, mm. uh, and haven't seen the documentaries that you've mentioned with James Quinn. And then I also watched uh, another doc- documentary with James McCrory. Yeah, the one on the Vice. On the Vice magazine, I thought really, that was really, really, good, really well done. Yeah. Uh, and then I, uh, uh, like, it was kind of weird because I didn't know who he was a few months ago. And then I was chatting to some guy in the shop, and uh, the guy kind of introduced us to this other guy. He says, "Oh, here's Cliffy does all the all the boxing in the northeast." And this guy was like, "Oh, have you not heard of?" James the Gypsy Boy and I was like no nah, I haven't heard of him <laughs> and he was like oh you want to check him out on YouTube so, and that's ex- exactly what I did that's it and then a, then a couple of months later yes, you're on ringside and he's starting next year with his suit on from Thailand and, and how mad was that <laughs> that's how quick it's it's so strange that that's how quick some things can happen you know it's like you're chatting about someone one minute and then next couple of weeks, you're actually chatting to them and doing like a documentary on them or something, you know. It's great, isn't it? Ah, uh, it is good. But um, and then there's um, there's the likes of we're meeting yourself and Dave, David Wheel as well, who's who's up and coming with the uh, with the K one as well. He's doing uh, he's got huge plans. Um, he's, he's doing really well. Present in dual fight sports. He, uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and he's uh, like obviously he's got connections. And, Amir from who's putting on the Super Faith Series Championships um, yeah. at Wembley, so he's got strong uh, like connections with him, you know. So I can see him going far in the. Yeah, I think so. And he's a nice guy as well. They're all nice guys. No, until you meet them in the ring. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. They look mean, but the once you break that down, the uh, the cool guys, you know. Yeah, I'm going to say one of the uh, the most amusing things I've ever seen was um, in the last Jewel Show Cliff, where you went into the cage mm. um, with a couple of fighters and some of the seconds and the referee and whatnot to take yeah, some man. shots. And then the next thing, there's just you and the two fighters in the cage. Oh, hey. <laughs> do, like, you know when you're kind of cut off and you think, oh, I'll just get this right, get the composition right, and you check out what's happening. And I, I just... The MC, I, I I was kind of fo- focused on the MC, and then I was moving around, and then I kind of shut off for a couple of like a half a minute, and then I I realised I was just in there with the two guys in the cage. <laughs> but uh, as you see in this, well, I kind of ran, kind of ran out. <laughs> well, I was sitting in the actual right cage because I was the timekeeper for the day, and yeah. if I wasn't laughing so much, I would have came in to uh, give some moral support. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it was with um, Paul Paul Venus. Paul Venus, yeah, I think it was. Yeah, yeah, it was with him, and I was thinking, well, you know, 
But, well, uh, he, seemed, he, he seems like a nice enough guy as well, but I wouldn't want to be yeah. in the cage with him, mind. No, no, I didn't want to be in a cage with him because nah. uh, that's their <laughs> job, you know. They do their job in the ring. and Exactly. Then, then I went up my steps for another five hours. <laughs> that's yeah. it. How did you first manage to get your foot in the door with pro boxing? Because they really seem to, you really gained the trust. And I mean, it's not just going in and take some shots. You, you're actually ringside, sometimes climbing on the ring, lying on the side of the ring. How did you manage to gain that trust and respect? Well, I'd, I'd like I'd like to think it was the quality of me of me work, but if it, if it's not, it's maybe me per, me personality. <laughs> Could be sporting personality. It's just like small things. I think it, you know. I think generally I'm quite quiet. I, I don't go into places shouting. I can do this and I can do that. And I kind of have a chat with people on one to one. I'm always on time when people ask us to be at places. Opposite to me. I'd, well, I got there before, Phil. <laughs> quite quite reliable. Always turn up to events. I always do uh, like the research and whatnot, you know. Yeah. And it's also chatting with uh, Mal Gates as well. So, uh, I've become good friends with Mal. I and, uh, he's a lovely of, guy, Mal. He is. He kind of invited us into his gym. Mm-hmm. And this is like really early doors, this. And then again with Mark Clozel, he kind of invited us to his gym as well. And I think... With the boxing scene, especially the uh, pro scene, it's like it's it's kind of if they like you, you get in. If they don't like you, if one one guy doesn't like you, it kind of, it, it kind of has a snowball effect. I think. Yeah, I think you could be right. And I think with me, it's I've been fortunate enough to get it on everyone's good side, and. Uh, and I've, I've provided all the boxers with discs and all that of the, of the stuff, and I, I've been doing that for about a year now. Yeah. And uh, and as soon as I see it now, the you know that uh, like they know exactly what they get. And uh, I've become uh, like good friends with uh, like a lot of the pro guys as well. Mm-hmm. Um, just like chat, chatting online to them sometimes, and then when I see them backstage, I don't get too involved, but I'm just there. Uh, but I think the that I've got, I think I've. I, I do get in there, take the shots behind the scenes and all this, but I'm not really noticeable. Well, that's I kind of blend into the background sometimes. That's what I was going to say. I mean, I've been to a lot, I go to a lot of boxing, a lot of BKB events and whatnot, and often there's a photographer there, and you can't see the fight or what's going on because of the photographer. Yeah. And I know the first time I'd sort of seen the ringside was at um, B. Barnett Newcastle. Yeah. And you got all settled ringside, and I know this is awful, but I forgot you were there. You just blend, you just blend in, and you don't yeah. get in the way, and you just forget that you're there. Yeah, yeah, that's a, uh, like a nut I've got, you know. I think that, I think that's got to be good to be honest, like the chameleon yeah. of the boxing world. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Um, I kind of just blend in, blend in the background. I don't get in anyone's face, but if you look at some of my shots, you think friggin' Ali must have been right in his face, but I kind of do it. Discreetly, you know. Yeah, that's it. Uh, but they all know I'm there, and they're all, they're all kind of want the photograph taken as well, so... A little, little bit uh, of vanity in the boxing world. That's it. So what do you think of the North East pro boxing scene at the minute? It, it seems to be sort of really growing at the minute with, like, say, Steve Wraith uh, joining force with Eddie Hearn, non-massive shows, People, all the new fighters coming forward from the likes of fighting chance promotions and uh, from Mal. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's improved massively from from the time when I've just been like a ca- casual fan, you know. Yeah. Um, in uh, like the northeast, um, was a couple of years ago. I didn't really know anyone in uh, like the local scene or the northeast scene. But the the whole game's kind of raised raised the ante, you know. But I still think there's room for improvement mm-hmm. with um, promotion and advertising and what uh, and whatnot. Yeah. But uh, but that's that's kind of a where people can come in. You know, I think we can help with a lot uh, a lot of that. Um, and uh, you've got your Phil Jeffries, you know, putting on huge shows, really. Cream of the crop and colossal the sub the summer rumbles. But, um, I, I don't know if Steve's took that over now. I don't really get involved with the politics of boxing. But then you got Steve Race and uh, Eddie Hearn, the match room. And then you, you had Steve Race, uh, like the Rising Stars, with uh, like the Fight Pass as well. I mean, yeah. 
these are like these aren't like small holes shows anymore. You know, they're getting like bit bigger and bigger. Um, That's it. Then you've got like more Clausel as well again, who's got plans for the future with both the amateur and the pro scene. And then coming just outside of the northeast, uh, you've got De- Dennis Hobson, who yep. people kind of forget about, but they remember who he is when he comes back into town. You know, and it's like he puts on. He puts on absolutely huge shows, uh, like the Rampage show. I mean, that, that was massive. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, I've got a different story to tell myself about Rampage, but, uh, I mean, I won't go into it now. People who know, know know kind of all about it, you know. Oh, you'll have to tell us afterwards. Oh, oh yeah, <laughs> definitely. If Dennis Hobson's listening, Dennis, Dennis, De- Dennis Hobson, please contact people who want to work with you. <laughs> And where you're on, Dennis, uh, we'll get you on for an interview as well, mate. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I know that you've uh, you've covered some some huge shows. A few weeks ago, uh, the Metal Radio Arena, uh, you covered the Jory Raw show. I mean, there were some huge names there, the likes of Anthony Joshua. Who were the biggest names that you've ever worked with? Well, David Hay, uh, who I met at Margate's gym. Yeah. Uh, really, really top guy. Uh, had time for ev- everyone. Chris Eubank Jr., Mm-hmm. Who I met, he seemed all right. Uh, took, well, I took a few shots of him, but then his dad asked him, asked us to wipe the whole card with all his shots on, which I thought was a bit uh, disappointed with. He never changes, does he? Paul Butler. Yeah. Uh, uh, had a good chat with him. Really sound. Orville McKenzie, Eddie Hearn, Frank Warren, Dennis Hobson, Stuart Hall, Billy Hardy, John. Johnny Nelson, Adam Smith, and then Brendan Engel. Who's, I've, always, I've always kind of wanted to meet him, you know, grow up, kind of watch him in the corner. And then when you kind of see him in a changing room, you just, not starstruck, but you think, hey, you know, it's uh, Bre- Brendan Engel. I, I, I take it who's who with the boxing world, really. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, like, I see them as, like, the kind of stars, you know. I don't see... Um, like pop stars as like celebrities and all that, but I see uh, like uh, like the boxing guys as the real stars, you know. Yeah, I totally agree with you there. Yeah, I know you've worked uh, quite a bit with um, English champion Anthony Nelson and your good friends in the past. Yeah. How did you feel a couple of weeks ago when he lifted the Commonwealth strap as well, and you were there ringside? Oh, it was absolutely brilliant. Um, because I've 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 kind of well we've kind of worked quite closely with uh team well we call them like team team gates yeah so it's like it's the whole team you know and uh and anthony's he just works he just works so so hard and i i keep hearing that he trains every day that like them guys don't get a day off you know yeah um, and i just think you know you put in you get you kind of get what you, what you put in and he uh like de- deserved that belt I mean, he's done amazingly well. I mean, his last two fights, yeah. he took the British title and the Commonwealth title. It's fantastic. And it was a good fight as well. But I've never really seen him pushed. Um, yeah. Because um, I, I heard through the great fight, well, when you're at ringside, when you're not close to them, you kind of see, you see things that other people don't see. Like as well, you see pe- people getting tired like really quickly. Yeah. As, a, as if you were sitting home watching it on TV, you know, when you're... It's, really it's, that it's very different, isn't it? It is very different, yeah. And when you, I think, I think yeah, his last fight was uh, Terry Broadbent, and that that was another Steve Ray show. I think he, I wouldn't say he got pushed then, but he was taking on kind of unnecessary shots. But I, I heard later on that you know, like he wasn't well, he couldn't train for this and that. And, yeah. And I thought, uh, if if Anthony came in fit, that that wouldn't have been half the half. You know, half the fight he would have made much e- like easier work of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, he told me that, and I'm sure, like I'm sure he's telling the truth as well. The, his work rate is is really high as well. It's, you know, he's just such a great guy. Yeah. So where do you see Anthony Nelson going from here? Do you think at some point we're gonna have a world champion from South Shields? I hope so. But I think he's got stiff com- competition in the in the ranks. Yeah. In, you know, you're kind of looking at Paul Butler, who mm-hmm. I've also mentioned, and then you've got Solani, Solani Teddy, yeah. Teddy, who's like the IBF champion. He's like, he's like a step above. 
So I think he's got to maybe up his game to, to get to the likes of these guys. Carlos Cordras, I think, is, an, is another WBC champion. Neo uh, in OV, I think, or, some, or something like that. I'm not really good with the names, but... See, this, um, is, what, this is what I think would make him a good champion, because it's much easier to say Anthony Nelson, isn't it? It is, it is, I uh, I know that was something on last week's show that uh, Steve Wraith was sort of hitting about a little bit that he could see him sort of maybe getting a world title shot at some point in the future. I don't, uh, I don't see why not, mate. You know. Yeah. But, um, I think he's great. He's a nice lad as well. He is a top top lad. When we did, like a, fo- a photo shoot with Anthony a couple of months ago, he picked us up from uh, like the station and all that. You know, he's just like a just a really sound lad. Ah, he is. Also at the Jordy Raw show, Cliff, you got some great shots of another local lad. Former British Cruiserweight champion John Lewis Dickinson. Yeah. Now in that show, he really recovered his form after losing his British title, and losing a couple of fights from there. The last one with Courtney Fry, but he's really picked up a convincing win. Was it good seeing him sort of taking these shots from ringside and come back to form? Oh, hi, yeah, it was because I, I was. I, it's not that I had me doubts, but um, I think that there was that much pressure on John. Yeah. Just off the subject a bit slightly, but we interviewed um, John G- Gibson from the Chronicle. Everybody knows Gibber. Gibber, yeah, and um, he he kind of brought up uh, John, and he was like, "Please, please God, please God, let John Lewis Dickinson win this next fight." And I thought to myself, "No pressure, John." But That's it. I mean, I, I mean, I know John quite well. I was really, really pleased for him. Uh huh. Uh huh. I mean. Yeah. Just co- coming off, you know, the defeat from uh, the upsetter over McKenzie, which was, I, I wish, mean, I was who, shocked. Who, I was who shocked gets in with him, you know? It's like, a, it's a tough ask. That's it, that's it. And then, because the, I, I was kind of, well, I wasn't, I wasn't, I was at the event for the, the Orville one, um, but I wasn't at ringside due mm. to unforeseen circumstances. But the Courtney Fry one, that was, Ferocious that one. Well, I was right at ringside for that, and uh, how two men can go like that all the way, I'll uh-huh. never know. I mean, I think maybe in hindsight, I don't know for sure, but maybe John John maybe overlooked Courtney. I'm not too sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when you when you're at ringside and you're looking at everything through a through a lens, you kind of see a different thing. Some some uh, some aims in Courtney Fry wasn't coming to to get beat down. He no, was, he definitely he was wasn't, really was he? Come to win. That's it. Oh, again, on the same show, were you surprised at the shock early defeat of uh, John's brother, uh, the late heavyweight English champion, Travis? Yeah, I was. I was uh, quite shocked with that. Um, I was really happy for John, and, and then I was like, oh, thank God John's won. And then Travis, and then I looked looked up, and he's on the floor, and I couldn't, you know, it's like I'm like, fight in the air, Last year, or mm-hmm. nominated fight fight of the year against Matty Clarkson. You've won a hell of a fight, that. You know, and I like I had a like I had a chat with him like eight months like after that, and he was just saying, "Oh, just kept hitting us in the the body, and I was winded, you know." So yeah, but uh, we had a chat about that for a while. But again, um, I looked at M- Mustafa, and again, I think he was overlooked. Yet again, and mm-hmm. he he come to he didn't come to to get beat. He was really he was really really up for it. Yeah. When you're at ringside, you kind of just sense like different things, but you've got to, your heart goes out to, to Travis. Travis. Yeah. Because he's just you know he's been out he's been out the game for a while, hasn't he? With his with an injured ankle. Yeah, the ankle. But, yeah. And he's he was probably raring to go, and maybe just a bit maybe a bit too e- eager. I'm not too sure. Yeah, but it's just he, he got caught with a shot, and as people say all the time in interviews, that's boxing. And that's it. So maybe it's only one shot. That's all it takes. Yeah, yeah, but I'm I'm positive Tra- Travis will be back definitely, definitely. Yeah, um, I think he'll be back stronger and harder and all the meaner for it to be honest. Yeah, mate, he will. I'm not too sure what will happen with with the Bob Asher safe fight, but I hope I, he gets that. I'd like to see that happen. Yeah, yeah, definitely. A bit awkward. Let's see what Travis can do, you know. Like, after this, I'm sure he'll come back str- stronger and well, he's a top guy as well. Well, I know John have got a nickname for Bob, but uh, I, do, I better start saying it on here. All right. <laughs> have you not heard that one? Um, no, no, I haven't. 
No, I suppose I best I, I best not say it. No, they call, right. they, they call him Bob the Knob. All right. <laughs> Sorry, Bob. Um, I'm not saying anything. Anyway, the man on sort of every boxing fan's lips at the minute is Anthony Joshua. What was it like meeting him and working with him? He's down to really like relaxed guy. Got a lot of time for you. Kind of reminds us of Frank Bruno. Yeah. But I don't know if that's just because of his sheer size and he's kind of got the Hall of Britain on mm-hmm. on his head, you know, wanting him to do well. He's got a, 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 like the Klitschko's, you know, saying all good things about him, uh, like they want to ma- manage him and everything. Yeah. And he loves Pete as well, so... Well, he must have good taste. Well, exactly, that's what I thought. I thought this guy's, you know, this guy's a bit special. Yeah, down... Uh, like really down to earth guy. Uh, got a lot of time for you, and he and he, he interviews well as well, you know. Because <laughs> how they got God knows how many interviews he does through the day, and he's obviously got to say that he hears the same questions. That's it. But he he tries to answer them all a bit differently. I think you know the field's open for him as well. You know, with, uh, with Tyson, David yeah. Price, Hay, Deontay Wilder, Pavotkin's there. Uh, uh, Kubra Pulev's there. There's a lot um, there, isn't there? And then you've got Huey Fury, who's hanging in the balance there in the background. But I think he could be future world champion, definitely. So, do you think he's got the talent that everybody seems to think that he has? I think he has, yeah. I don't think there's anyone... He hasn't, hasn't really had a test off anyone as of yet. I think, like I said, Prince... And I see him a few years ago. Um, he's very, he's he's very good. But when he comes up against somebody who's like not scared of him, yeah, like Antonio Barrera, for instance, we'll see we'll see how how good you are. You know, I've got every faith in him as he's he's big and strong and all that, but he's quite quick as well. Yeah, I, I think that's the combination. Sometimes when you get the really big lads with the really powerful and strong, sometimes yeah. they haven't got the speed, but he does seem to have. Yeah, yeah, he's got the speed all right, mate. Uh, like I watch him at ringside there, and he's um, he's he ki- he's kind of toying with the with the guys at the moment. I think he said he, one of his toughest tests was uh, Matt Skelton, mm-hmm. and uh, if you probably know who Matt is. Um, yeah. I think they call him the Bear, the Big Bear. Oh. But he's like an old, tough, durable guy, and he got him out of there, you know. So. I think the future is bright for Anthony. That's it. I mean, he's. I mean, he's. He's had quite a quick sort of rise to stardom, rise to fame, if you like. So I think it's good for him to have a fights. Maybe they don't test him fully, so mm. he can learn his trade, learn his ring craft a little bit. Yeah, yeah. The definitely. experience. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I'm. Uh, and I mean, there's talk of him and David Price as well. So that'd be good. It would be good, but I I kind of don't want to say because I uh, I like the David Price, you know. Yeah. But uh, the powers that be, I mean, they'll sort it. You never know. You never know, there. <laughs> Where did you first get your love of boxing from? Do you think? Well, just always watching it on TV. Grow, kind of growing up with it, really. Just watching call like I kind of when I was young, I was watching Ben and Chris Eubank and Michael Watson, watching all these guys, you know, and. And then watching like the documentaries that go with the build-ups, that's what kind of got us into it. It's not the actual fights, but the the build-up. Yeah. The press conferences, the egos, and all that, you know. Yeah, just watching like Carl Frotch as well and Mike Tyson, obviously. I mean, mm. everyone loves Mike Tyson, but uh, uh, my hero. Yeah, Van Van der Holyfield, ball. Yeah. I mean, they had three fights. I mean, I watched. Uh, uh, like I remember watching the first one. I don't know if it was the first one or the se- the second one when a guy came down on a on a hand glider. On a hand glider was the second one. <laughs> do, you, uh, do you know the story about me and Riddick Bo? No, I don't. Well, start off it was at the Grove and Casino. Uh, it was one of Steve Wraith's uh, meet and greets. Yeah. Um, and I went up with Paul Charters and we're sitting there with me, Paul, Mal, uh, oh, I can't remember who else was on the table at the front. And um, he's talking away with it, poor. And all of a sudden, he just stopped. And he looked me dead in the eye, and he went, You look like Scooby-Doo. I said, Scooby-Doo? And he went, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and then went back to what he was saying. 
Yeah. And the whole room was just sitting there, quiet. I mean, Dave Wheel never lets us forget this. And he mentioned to Riddick, boy, are they Scooby-Doo? Oh, all right. And I've still, to this day, got no idea why I look like Scooby-Doo. Maybe be floppy ears, but it was just bizarre. Scooby-Doo. It, it was like he was sort of there in the room, and then he just switched off like he was a child for a couple of seconds, and then went back. It was... But he had to pick on me, didn't he? Well... He, <laughs> see, he seems like a cool guy as well, but... I, I mean, he's got a... Uh, I think he's got a bit of a short temper. I think, I think he has a bit of a check I'd passed as well I mean he served time for kidnapping his ex-wife and putting her in the boot of his car alright and that, that's through his own admission uh, I mean he told some great stories when we talked about that fight with the hang glider he seems to think that it was a fix yeah. and from what he said it, it does sort of add up a little bit see they were in the middle of the Nevada desert for the fight uh-huh. it was really really cool because it was night time and this fellow on the hand glider flew in from behind him, so he couldn't see. Uh-huh. And then before he'd even landed, uh, Van der Holyfield was all wrapped up in blankets and things like that to keep him warm and keep him ready. Uh-huh. Rick Bo didn't know what the hell was going on, neither did his corner, and they were all freezing cold, and he puts that down to why he lost the fight. Mm. But it could just be an excuse. Do you agree with that, though? Well, I didn't when I listened to it, and then I watched the fight again, and it's right exactly what he says, but no, I don't think that's the reason why. Uh-huh. Were, uh, I mean, there were hellish fights. Weren't they? But uh, I, think I think they go down uh, in history, those ones, you know. One of my favourite boxers is Andre Ward. Yeah. I've, all, like, I've always been watching him, you know. It's, um, one of my favourite fights, well, one of my favourite new, newish fights of the last four five, four, five years, um, Andre Ward and Carl Froch. Yeah. I was I was a massive 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 fan of Carl Froch, right up until before he fought Andre Ward. Just, he kind of started to change a bit, mm. not like big headed or uh, anything like that, but um, just he's. I think he's starting. He was starting to believe he's on hype. I think at one point. I think he still is, to be honest. A little bit. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Have you read the stories about uh, Froch this week? Um, seeing that uh, Joe Calzaghe ducked him. Uh, um, it, yeah. And, and he came out of the game because he knew he would lose to him. What do you think of that? Well, I've never been a huge fan of, of Joe. But his achievements, I mean, but he, he's great, you know. Like, I'm yeah. not saying he's, he was bad or I didn't really like it. It's just his style I didn't like, not mm. him personally. Yeah. But I think he would have gave Carl, like, a, not a lesson, but I think he just would have out, outworked Carl, I think. So do I. And I think it would have just been a bit too ring smart, uh, like for him, you know. I just thought it was a funny sort of time for him to come out and say this, really. I think he's is he hoping for Joe to come to come back out for his last fight? I think. You never know. You never know. <laughs> let's let's make it happen. <laughs> if you listen to Joe, give we're ring and we'll talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. How did you find? I mean, we've talked about sort of how quickly peeps broke into the world of BKP. Uh, was it a little bit daunting at first? Sort of within two days, um, you were interviewing one day the contender for the British heavyweight title, mm-hmm. and then the next day you were ringside taking photographs for Michael Ferry's eight second defeat over Craig Amor. Mm. Um, yes, I was very, very apprehensive. Um, yeah. I just, just like we say, you know, it's like I didn't listen to all the the bad press about the BKB because once you get there, it's like a totally different scene, isn't it? But, uh, yeah, it is. Um, and I think it is going to get large as well. I think I think it's, I think it's going to go massive, you know. Yeah, I do. Um, I just got a bit of a shock when I when I went into, uh, to Dave Wheel's place and then I seen Sean Smith. <laughs> the I deck, got, I, the I, I got in the back there. Uh, <laughs> I'll tell, okay. tell you what it is he's an absolutely lovely guy I would like yeah. to owe money but yeah. he's a lovely bloke I think I, I think he's on uh, like the vice again with um, Britain yeah, yeah Britain's, it's, fan, it's fantastic um, are they Britain's, uh, Britain's baddest de- deck collector that's the one yeah after getting over that initial shock of seeing Sean Smith uh, I turned around and I bumped into Dave Courtney <laughs> and, uh, and I was like right just get <laughs> It's not every, like every day you bump into these guys. I'll say again, another friend of mine, lovely bloke, he's, uh, he's desperate to come on the show, so Dave, if you listen, we'll get you on really soon, mate. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. And um, you know, it just it kind of adds to the um, the atmosphere of the whole BKB, the B Bad thing. You know, it's just two guys that are getting in there with Dave Courtney MCing, and he was yeah. he was absolutely great at this. Wasn't he? Sean Smith being the ref, I thought. I think Sean's a brilliant referee. I mean, I've yeah. seen him at a few B Bad events now. I think he's really, really good referee. Yeah, yeah. It was it was kind it was kind of like a scene up off a of film. That's it. Yeah. I mean, if he wasn't, I wouldn't say that anyway, but no, he, he really is. Uh-huh. And then I turned around and there was one guy who looked like a bad guy from like a James Bond film, and I was like, <laughs> what, <laughs> what that... have I got myself into here? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's some funny looking fellas there, but uh, lovely bunch of people. I mean, what did yeah. you think of the, the whole setup with a bad show, show, like the medical care and things like that? Oh, I thought it was absolutely great, man. Um, because when you hear, when you read things and you, you think it's all like uh, bales of hay and there's no one there, it's just people shouting. Yeah. You know, over the bales of hay and there's pints swelling and all that. That's just like, it, it might have happened a few years ago or when it was first starting off, but the whole scene's like totally changed now and it's true. Uh, like, I mean, it. you'll say that for yourself. It's all, it's it's much like a, like a pro boxing show. Isn't it? Really well yeah. organised and I think yeah. it's still got a little bit of stigma there for some people and oh. it was good sort of you coming into it and you were a bit apprehensive about it and I could sort of see you getting into it and enjoying it and realising what it was all about. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what once I got, well, like I said, once I got over, like, over the shock, I had to kind of uh, de- desensitise myself because you know, like, I'm not used to sit, well, you know, I'm used to the boxing scene but it's gloved and it's yeah. and it's all a bit uh, like slower as well. Mm-hmm. Um, with the BKB, it's it was like high high speed. It's fast and, and furious. It was fast and I couldn't quite get the grips with it, and I was like, "Whoa, this is all a bit different." But once you once you start like saying the guys, and it's not just a it's not just the like bell rings all out, like you know, fist flying everywhere and. It's it's more planned, you know, mm-hmm. and it's there's guys within the BKB scene who've got a lot of skill. Ah, uh, there is. I mean, you've got the likes of Dave Radford. I mean, he fought Roberto with Duran at one point when he in his pro career. That's what I mean. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. And then, and then you've got the likes of uh, Bobby Gunn, who's been on your show. I'll tell you. I was shocked when I when I heard all the all the guys who he's been around with and fought. No, I tell you, he used to be a uh, professional cruiserweight champion. Yeah, I was. Uh, uh, not not like shocked, but I was like a bit blown back, you know, like, whoa, like he's been he, he's been around the world with uh, like these pros, you know. That's it, that's it. So as well, you thought about your recently venture into the world of uh, award with video and photography in the last dual fight sports event. Did you enjoy this? I did yeah, it was again really apprehensive, and I think I think I bumped into you at, at the uh, yeah. at the door. You looked at us, and it's like you look really scared. <laughs> Well, I mean, I was. I've never really been interested in K1, it's only my thing, and I came up to see you for a, just for five minutes. Dave Real, as we mentioned, who runs Jewel, uh, he's an old mate of mine, he got stuck for an, uh, an official timekeeper, so he asked yeah. for a favour. Mm-hmm. Well, I absolutely loved it. Yeah, and I think um, I'll definitely be going back to K1, and Dave, if you're listening, I want to be the official timekeeper next time as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Dave, if you're listening, I'll see you at the next show. <laughs> 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 Just like you've said before, you had the likes of Paul Venus. Yeah, Paul and Venus. Lucas Rebeck. I mean, yeah. all these guys who I hadn't hadn't heard of, but once you get to, to see them in the cage, I mean, these are like the like the skill levels really really good, and like, Fant- you're a bit taken aback, you know. Fantastic, it is. And then Miro. Mickey Tr- Mickey Drell. Fantastic. He was there as well, but I haven't seen him fight yet, but. I've seen him fight on YouTube a couple of times. I think he's the one to watch for. He's got well, absolutely you know? fantastic talent um, uh-huh. in K1, but also in boxing as well. Uh-huh. Won a King of the Ring, a four-man sort of prize fight at that tournament a few weeks ago. But he's got seriously dubious taste in Facebook posts. That's all I'm saying. All right. If you listen to Mickey, you know you have. So if anybody was interested in having Pete Mag's magazine cover the fighters or the shows, again, how can they go about this? Yeah, well, you can just uh, contact me direct, uh, cliff at peepmagazine.co.uk. 
give us a follow on Twitter at Peep Magazine or you can go straight to the website peepmagazine.co.uk and then I'm on Facebook as well Cliff Sainsbury or you can join the Peep group which is also on there uh, I'm just trying to think of any any other av- uh, avenues you know we've got the peepblog.co.uk where if, if, if there's uh, photographs or um, tail end of interviews that we, that we haven't got time to put up or they're, they're a bit too long we'll put, we'll put them on the Peep blog Yep. Uh, I know there's a lot of your stuff on there, Stu, as well, but um, with the, uh, the undercards and all that from um, from the B-Bar show. That's right, yeah. And uh, we'll always want to push that, you know, and if, and if there's anyone out there who wants to con- contribute um, to writing for the blog or writing for the mag- uh, for the magazine, um, just get in touch, get in touch with yourself, get in touch with uh, Stu Armstrong. Great stuff, get in well. Touch with Phil Lindsay. Well, all the links for Peep, I mean, they're already on my website, as I was saying. So, again, it's either peepmagazine.co.uk, Facebook or Twitter, or if you go to stuarmstrong.com, uh, you can get in contact that way as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, anybody that's seen your work, they've got to be blown away with it. I mean, you're, you're a complete dab hand with a camera and a video camera, no matter how modest you are. How did you first get involved with photography? Um, well, some... Some people think I've just picked this up like within the last year or so, but I came on the scene within the last year. Uh, I mean, I've only been doing it for about uh, maybe a year and a couple, couple, couple of months with the boxing, um, but I've kind of always done it. Um, mm. It's gone it's gone back from you know three four years of college, then I graduated to college, went to, u- to university for another three years, um, always with a camera in my hand, but. Um, but in university, I kind of used it as uh, like research. Um, yeah. I didn't, I didn't like ever really take photographs to say, "Oh, have you seen my photograph?" It was like always to present other work. So, mm. um, uh, like, because I'm really interested in uh, like the film side of things, and I made a couple of short films, um, yeah. like one an award for like one short film. Um, but what happened was. I was actually taking photographs of stills of storyboards for that film. Yeah. If that makes sense, and then a couple, yeah. couple of uh, like my lecturers said, just pulled this to one side, and it was like, wow, these these shots are absolutely uh, amazing, you know. But to be fair, I've, without me being big-headed, but I've always had these type of compliments all the way through like ed- education. Mm-hmm. I've all, I've always had them, but I tend to put them to, to one side, and you move on and doing other stuff. And uh, it's it's not until I was in my last year uh, at university that I knew I knew I was I was going to gra- uh, graduate with the first, you know. Yeah. Um, and my lecturer says, I think you should, I think you're good with the film. You've got you've got a good eye and and all this, but um, but the photography I think is where you're gonna is where you're gonna uh, excel at, you know. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so we just had a chat for a while, talking about what type of where what type of areas I can get into. Um, and I didn't really want to go down the, hi, I'm a photographer, I do landscapes, or yeah. I do still life, I do port- portraits, and I'm not really interested in that type of work, mm-hmm. because, if, you know, if you want to sit in front of your desk or computer all day and manipulate your photo to Photoshop, and then you make it all lovely and nice, and that's fair enough, you can you can do that, you know, but... Yeah. It's really, it really not what I'm, I'm about, and that's why uh, I took a photography up uh, full time, mm-hmm. uh, and then I got into the boxing scene as quick as I could. But it was uh, I, I actually got offered a job on a um, on on a cruise ship, and I've like been around the world and taking photographs, and uh, I, I've kind of done all that thing, you know. And it's, yeah. There's only you know, there's only so many pictures you can take of people in sunsets and palm trees and exactly um, and then you can manip- uh, like manipulate them for people to buy and it's all great um, but it's just again just not really what I was interested in so mm-hmm. I think I think uh, I think the boxing scene for me personally is is like the rawest form of uh, photog- uh, like photography you know. Yeah, it seems to suit you. Yeah, you either get it wrong or you get it right, and then when you get it right, it's, you know, it's something 
really good to look at, even though it's two, two other people just saw just two guys in the ring, but I'm I'm trying to put it as an art form, you know. I think you're doing very well at it. Oh, hey, thanks a lot. That's it. Well, thank you very much for your time, Cliff. That's been fantastic as always talking to you. Oh, um, yes, and I've got to say, I'm really part, I'm really proud to be part of the, the team at Pete Magazine, and I think the future is going to be very bright. Yeah, yeah. If there's uh, if there's anyone else out there who wants to contribute, well, there already is in this too. I mean, there's there's pe- people mm-hmm. contact we're like ev- ev- every day now. There is, there is that. But, it's, um, uh, it's really taken off. But I'm pleased you're part, you're part of the team, mate. You and Phil and Mark Clausell as well and David Weald and Steve Race who contributes to the magazine. Yeah, I think Steve contributes to a little bit of everything, doesn't he? Uh, but that's how... Uh, there's, there's no show without Steve. We'd want it any other way, would we? Exactly, there's no show without Steve. <laughs> well, that's brilliant. Thank you very much for your time. Um, as I say, anybody that's uh, that's interested in Peep Magazine, please go and have a look at peepmagazine.co.uk and search for Peep Magazine on YouTube. And don't forget to join me every Wednesday at 9 for the Stu Armstrong interviews, we are bringing you the biggest and best names in combat sports from around the world. Listen free online worldwide at RadioNorthumberland.com and don't forget to pay me a visit at StuArmstrong.com and play uh, Cliff a visit at PeepMagazine.co.uk. You're listening to Radio Northumberland, the best in combat sports.